watches are consulted. Radio silence is imposed upon the task force. The bomb is being armed by radio control from the Cumberland Sound. Eyes turn toward the LSM-60. 90 feet below her and halfway to the bottom hangs the caisson which encloses the fifth atomic bomb. The caisson swings gently in the current like a cradle rocked in a subsurface wind. Grim silence has settled over the lagoon. On the Cumberland Sound, automatic controls have taken over. Panel lights flicker. Transmitters hum. Tension grows. Perspiration beads foreheads, though the room is air-conditioned. Time now is measured in seconds. Ten. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Fire! A flash of yellowish light, and the lagoon erupts as if the earth beneath is disemboweled. Up goes a geyser like a thousand Niagara's in reverse. 400,000 tons of water rising vertically against the pull of gravity, scattering fragments of the LSM-60 over the lagoon. As it rises, the column cascades outward into a spiked cauliflower. Then, collapse begins. At one second, the column has reached 4,100 feet. At 60 seconds, 7,600 feet. The crown of the cauliflower curves outward and down, shadowing the target array. This is the derby hat phase. As the column plunges back to the sea, a surge develops at the base of the column and a wall of spray, foam and poisoned fog sweeps outward at the initial rate of 60 knots, an unpredicted phenomenon. This is the most poisonous fog that mankind has known since the dawn of creation. It contains residual plutonium. Whirling and seething, the fog dwarfs and engulfs the vessels and for a time enshrouds the lagoon. This surge reached a height of 2,000 feet and extended over a radius of 8,000 feet. The rain and mist covered an area of 15 square miles and was lethal over an area of about 9 square miles. Slowly, winds carried the murky cloud to the northwest. For an hour, it was readily observed. At the end of two hours, it could no longer be distinguished from the normal cloud mass on the horizon. Gigantic waves had been created by the explosion. These were 94 feet from trough to crest at 300 yards from zero point, and 9 feet from trough to crest at 2 miles. The first wave raced out at 45 knots, rocking the entire fleet. bomb-produced surf was clearly visible to orbiting planes. Although these waves represented less than 1% of the bomb energy, they contributed significant damage to at least five of the target ships. Between the base surge and the radioactive rain which fell on the lagoon from the cloud, all but nine of the target vessels were alive with contamination immediately after the blast. Witnesses searched for adjectives to describe the might of this explosion. They had no precedent with which to compare it. One fact alone stunned the imagination. The blast had produced an 1,100-yard circular crater 25 feet deep in the floor of the lagoon and had flung up over 2 million cubic yards of bottom material. After the blast, there was a layer of mud and sand several feet thick on the bottom of the lagoon in the neighborhood of the detonation point. The condensation cloud gave the blast a momentary appearance of a birthday cake on a platter. This condensation stage lasted but a brief moment. By four seconds, the cloud had reached maximum size, roughly one mile in diameter. At 18 seconds, it became ring-formed and began to stratify. By 30 seconds, it had vanished. The amount of energy released was normal for a bomb of the Nagasaki type. 
comparable to the energy released by the explosion of 20,000 tons of TNT. Drone performance was even more satisfactory than on Able Day. All drones and mother planes were jolted as if by a close burst of flak. The B-17, which was flown over the burst at 6,000 feet, was battered by the shock wave, but completed its flight and landed safely. Its bomb bay doors were warped. All inspection plates were blown open. The tail gunner's escape hatch was blown inward. The canvas boot over the tail wheel was split. Study of the flight analyzers revealed that this aircraft underwent reactions never before explored in flight. The air shock wave at 6,000 feet was approximately 1.9 pounds per square inch, lasting more than one half second. Another drone at 16,000 feet was over the target center two seconds after detonation. Its cameras aimed vertically produced an interesting record of the burst. The air shock wave at this altitude is illustrated by the severe shaking of the aircraft which stopped the camera. Engine operation of the drones was not noticeably affected. Radio control, even during moments of the blast itself, was not affected at the distances studied. Far less radioactive material was present in the air than after the Able Day explosion. One B-17 drone landing at Eniwetok was slightly damaged when wind conditions and brake trouble caused it to run off the end of the runway and over an embankment to the coral shelf. Damage was not severe, and recovery of instruments with recorded data was complete. Within an hour, the first radio-controlled drone boat was sent into the target array to collect water samples. As the drone boats returned from their sampling missions, crews hosed them repeatedly to wash off radioactive spray. The drone boats were used for radiological surveys for two days after detonation. They could go with impunity where man still dared not venture. Meanwhile, salvage crews and instrumentation teams had entered the target array to collect the recording instruments which had been set out. Film from the towers was recovered and rushed to processing laboratories. Boarding teams removed animals from target ships under difficult conditions because of time limits imposed by radioactivity. As reports filtered back from inspection crews, early estimates of damage were made. The LSM-60 directly over the bomb had completely disappeared. The 26,000 ton Arkansas, moored 200 yards from zero point, had capsized and sunk within the first minute after the blast. She settled upside down on the floor of the lagoon. Divers found her bottom sieved with holes, her side shell plating broken at many points. Rivets had failed at seams and butts, and her hull was indented as much as six feet in some areas. Virtually all her damage was below her waterline, a characteristic of Test Baker. The Saratoga had been 350 yards from zero point. She had suffered no severe structural distortion or hull ruptures, but she was sinking from progressive flooding through leaking rivet seams. The forward half of her stack lay across her flight deck. The stacks surviving the blast were carried away by mass movement of water. Shortly, she developed a slight starboard list. No salvage crew could approach. Radioactive death lurked everywhere. Not even a pelican hook could be attached to her anchor chain to tow her to shallow water. It was the death of a gallant warrior, bleeding oil in great gushes which spread over the lagoon. Her guns now silenced forever. Seven times the Japanese had announced this ship sunk. Difficult now to watch was the death of old Sarah. After eight hours struggle, she gave a final lurch, straightening herself for the grave. At 1616, she slipped beneath the surface 
leaving a lonesome gap against the late afternoon sky. The Japanese battleship Nagato had begun to list to starboard and settle by the stern shortly after the explosion. She had been moored at 745 yards and was flooding progressively. By a quirk, one of the mooring buoys of the capsized LCT-1114 had been cast up on her deck by the blast. She was radiologically unsafe to board, and though salvage crews begged to take on the job of damage control or beating, permission was denied. On the fourth day, when her doom was certain, orders were issued to be prepared to torpedo her next day as a test of new torpedoes. But she spent her last moments alone in the moonless night, unseen. When morning came, she was gone. Air bubbles told where she had sunk. Three submarines sank in the explosion. The pilot fish went down, nearly all compartments flooded, the tops of her ballast tanks no longer tight, and her superstructure dished in. She had been 260 yards from zero point. Divers recovered vital instruments that had been attached to her deck and bridge. The skipjack at 800 yards went down with a crack in her athwart ship plating above one of the torpedo rooms. Later, she was raised and returned to San Francisco for detailed study. Her forward battery compartment and her control room were flooded and the tops of her ballast tanks leaked. The Apagon at 845 yards sank in deeper water with most of her compartments flooded. Her conning tower hatch and several bulkheads had failed and a tank top was ruptured. Divers found a hole through the pressure hull forward. A fourth submarine, the Dentuda, submerged at 1500 yards had settled to the bottom from flooding that a crew could have controlled. Raised, she had to be beached. Damage to other submarines was not significant, although raising them called for solid seamanship by divers, salvage workers, and deckhands. Exteriors of all the submarines raised required decontamination. Submarine hulls proved their ability to absorb much damage. Nevertheless, submarine batteries, although shock-mounted, proved seriously vulnerable. The concrete barge YO-160 sank immediately. Another small craft, the LCT-1114, was capsized by the burst. Her bottom showed no evidence of damage. Demolition charges were used to sink her. Five ships were immobilized by the blast. The Fallon, nearest of the APAs to the explosion at 500 yards, had her shell and bottom wrinkled, her decks buckled, her hatches dished in, her boiler foundations stressed, and her air casings ruptured. On the Fallon, as on several other ships, radioactive coral sand from the lagoon bottom and fragments apparently from the LSM-60 were found. Beached with the Fallon was the destroyer Hughes, which had flooded through fractured sea connections and piping. At 635 yards, all her boilers were badly damaged. Her main engines were inoperable. Wave action had damaged topside hamper and two torpedoes hung precariously from her deck tubes. The Gasconade, 580 yards, flooded her engine spaces through broken saltwater lines, but she remained afloat. Her shell was wrinkled, her hatches were dished in, and much electrical equipment was damaged. The cruiser Pensacola, crippled by the air burst, was the largest ship immobilized by the underwater burst. She was 640 yards from zero point. Her boilers were badly damaged. Three of her main battery mounts were inoperable. Propelling and auxiliary machinery was seriously damaged. Hull damage added to the destruction. Shell plating was dished in and bulkheads and stanchions were deranged. She was kept floating only by difficult salvage operations. The LST-133 was rendered immobile by damage to her main deck, hull and ballast tanks. Flooding made her machinery inoperative. Five ships suffered serious loss of military efficiency. Three of these were battleships. The New York, at 820 yards, suffered minor flooding from opened seams in shell plating and tanks. Three turrets were inoperable from fractured holding down clips. Two boilers were temporarily useless and her fire pumping system and a diesel generator were rendered inoperable. The Nevada, at 1030 yards, suffered damage to her main steering unit and diesel generator. 
The holding down clips on one main turret were sheared off, making the turret inoperable. Much dished in plating was observed. The Pennsylvania at 1,200 yards suffered minor structural failure and leaked through stern tubes and shaft glands. The Salt Lake City at 1,200 yards leaked after the heavy hull shock through stern tubes, shaft glands, rudder bearings, and some piping. The destroyer Mayrant at 815 yards received damage to bulkheads, stanchions, and weather hatches, plus flooding from broken lines and some boiler damage. In general, surface vessels within 800 yards were either sunk, rendered immobile, or seriously impaired in military efficiency. Slight loss of military efficiency was felt by vessels as far out as 1,300 yards from blast center. The range of major hull damage for typical service combat vessels was approximately 625 yards. The range of minor hull damage was approximately 950 yards. Eight of the 18 target craft on the beach were swamped or partially flooded. One LCVP was washed off the beach and sank. Baker Day, however, produced information more overwhelming than the vast extent of ship damage. For the first time, the insidious potentialities of radioactive contamination were fully revealed. These death-dealing potentialities had been predicted. Now they were actual. Months later, lingering radioactive contamination was an invisible menace to any form of life at Bikini. For days, and in some cases months after the tests, monitors carried out extensive patrols of Bikini Lagoon, the target ships, aircraft, the islands, the air, and the open sea adjacent to the lagoon. Shortage of monitors handicapped the work, but by dint of great effort it was accomplished. Data from thousands of radiation recording devices had to be tabulated in these studies. For the first time, detailed studies of radioactive contamination could be made. In previous atomic explosions, most of the radioactive poisons had been carried off in the mushroom clouds. Now, about 50% of these fission products remained in the water where they had been discharged by the blast. Decontamination was a grave problem. Methods had to be improvised to reduce the overall contamination sufficiently to allow collection of instruments and technical examinations. The poisons restricted the movement of men and ships. They made target vessels uninhabitable for long periods. They revealed how a harbor or an entire city could be crippled with silent, unseen death. In test Abel, gamma radiation was dominant. In test Baker, alpha and beta particles were an added danger. Months after the explosion, target vessels were death traps for human life because of these radiations. Continuous monitoring was necessary to protect workers from undue exposure. Fatalities could occur from ingestion or inhaling of microscopic quantities of plutonium or long-lived fission products. The deadliness to humans is aggravated by their tendency to accumulate in the bones. Radiologists knew that alpha radioactivity from plutonium diminishes very little over periods of years. How to cope with this plutonium poisoning is still one of the chief problems of health physics and of industrial hygiene. Decontamination of dangerous areas requires new knowledge and new techniques employed by large groups of skillfully trained radiological personnel. Gamma radiation in Test Baker differed from similar radiation in Test Abel. In Test Abel, the period of intense gamma radiation was limited to seconds. In Test Baker, intense gamma radiation remained in some areas for weeks and in others for months. Radioactivity in the water was created by fission products which emitted beta and gamma radiation and by unfission plutonium from the bomb which emitted alpha particles. The alpha particles themselves are of low penetrating power, but micrograms of alpha emitting material within the human body are fatal. Gamma rays readily penetrate flesh, water, and clothing, but are reduced to half intensity by about one inch of steel. The cloud and base surge caused a radioactive precipitation 1,800 yards upwind from zero point and two to five miles downwind. 
This rain deposited radioactive material on the surface of the water. Six days after detonation, extremely high radioactivity was reported in the layer of mud and sand on the bottom. Diffusion and convection currents had done their work. Radioactivity would have brought death to thousands of men if personnel had been exposed on the target ships. At 1,000 yards, topside personnel would receive fatal doses within one minute. If their ships were immobile or contaminated, they would receive 20 times the lethal dose within an hour. These are grim facts. Topside personnel within 1,700 yards upwind and 2,500 yards downwind would receive lethal doses within five minutes. If they sought shelter below decks, the dose would be reduced by more than one half, but survival would be a long chance only. Porous materials such as cordage, canvas, and wood were much more heavily contaminated than were metal surfaces. Ships with wooden decks absorbed much more radioactive rain than did ships with metal decks. Closed hatches and ventilators kept much radioactive material from penetrating the interiors of target vessels. When leakage did occur, decontamination problems were serious. Certain below deck areas on the Salt Lake City read as high as 20 rentgens per 24 hours, 13 days after the blast. Similar below deck conditions existed on other vessels because radioactive water had entered through openings resulting from able day damage. Submarines being submerged were not subjected to the radioactive rain, so contamination was less than with surface vessels. Bitumastic applied to submarine hulls showed a particular affinity for radioactive products. Decontamination of this porous material, when necessary, was difficult. Target vessels were not alone in exposure to radioactivity. Support ships operating in the lagoon began collecting deposits of radioactive material in their evaporators and saltwater lines. Removal of these deposits presented serious problems and crew activity had to be carefully monitored. Marine growth and rust spots also favored accumulation of fission products. This situation posed a separate problem requiring attention upon return of the ships to major ports. Fewer animals were exposed in Test Baker, but results were even more striking. Virtually all of the Test Baker animals were dead by 1 November 1946, victims in most cases of gamma radiation. No animals were exposed topside. The animals were placed in the sick bay operating rooms on four APAs, the Gasconade, the Briscoe, the Catron, and the Bracken. Death of pigs and rats on the Gasconade, Briscoe, and Catron was caused by gamma radiation which passed through the metal of the decks and bulkheads after emanating from contaminated material which surrounded these vessels. When recovered, the more heavily irradiated animals were already in a dying state, capable of only feeble muscular activity. Others suffered from diarrhea and extensive hemorrhage into the skin and other tissues. Although the greatest amount of shock from the Baker blast was transmitted through the water, the shock wave in the air was equivalent to that from an explosion of 4,000 tons of TNT. Through instrumentation, scientists confirmed that the peak pressure in the water at close distances was greater halfway between the surface and the bottom than it was just beneath the surface. The positive pressure in the water, a tremendous hammer blow against the hulls, lasted for about two milliseconds. The negative phases and reflected pulses followed. Underwater pressure was irregular because of different angles of reflection from the bottom of the lagoon. As quickly as possible after Baker Day, technical and scientific groups made their inspections, gathered up their test materials, instruments, and data, and returned to the United States. General homeward movement of the task force soon left only skeleton logistic detachments and radiological survey teams behind. By September 26, 1946, Bikini Atoll was completely evacuated. Entry of unauthorized shipping to the lagoon is still restricted. Many of the target ships remained at Kwajalein for further radiological study. All ships of the supporting force were carefully monitored when they arrived at United States ports. Those that showed residual radioactivity were decontaminated. At the Joint Task Force headquarters in Washington, 
work of preparing the general joint task force report and more detailed unit reports was accomplished. Scientific analysis was initiated at military installations, universities, technological institutes, and research laboratories throughout the country. Obviously, only data which could quickly be extracted and readily be analyzed could be included in the preliminary reports. But even these soon grew into 30,000 pages of technical matter. They are still growing. Complete evaluation and correlation of significant information will require years. Some results had an immediate practical application. Some groups will continue to be interested in dynamic effects of the explosion. The ship, water, and air motions and their consequences. Radiation, shock pressures, displacements, stresses, and distortions. Other groups are concerned with measurement of physical change wrought on materials. These changes include transformations in solid structures, loss of strength, metallurgical effects, absorption of radioactivity, and decline of corrosion resistance or durability. During July and August 1947, a year after the Abel and Baker explosions, a comprehensive resurvey was made of Bikini Lagoon. Studies were made of residual radiation, particularly in food organisms. Great attention was given to dangers from alpha radiation. New biological specimens were taken both from the islands and from the surrounding reefs and waters. Deep cores were drilled into the coral to determine atomic effects upon reef building processes. These cores went almost twice as deep as previous drilling in a Pacific atoll. Divers raised important instruments that could not be previously recovered. The sunken Arkansas, Saratoga, Nagato, Pilotfish, Gilliam, and Apagon were of revived interest. Examination was also made of a portion of the LSM-60. Scientists were particularly interested in types of rupture, heat effects, and radioactivity. For the first time, underwater television was put to scientific use. An underwater camera was lowered over the submarine Apagon, lying in about 160 feet of water. While no new data was obtained by this experiment, the test pointed the way to interesting developments.